welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. So I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, you need God. Come on, stand to your feet. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts, our lives. We thank you, Father, we have a coming to the house of God uh, this night to hear from a man or a woman, hear from a tall man or short man or young man or old man or white man or black man or brown man. We've come into the house of God to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all of the honor. Thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives this day. We'll give you the praise. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching, hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless them, Lord. If they're preaching and hearing the gospel, they're our brothers and our sisters. We want them blessed as much as we want ourselves blessed. We thank you, Father, for uniting the churches in one cause. You know, that cause be in your word. Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout. We all say amen. amen. Well, go ahead and take your Bibles and, and uh, let's take a look at the word of the Lord. If you're making notes tonight, this is an interesting kind of a title. It's called Facts Versus Truth. Somewhere along the line in your life, you're going to have to come to a place where um, you and I realize that truth is really greater and more important than any fact we could ever come up with. It sounds crazy. Most people don't understand that. It'll, if you don't understand what I just said, your entire faith concept about God will be under tremendous, tremendous attack. For most people, facts are more important than truth and more powerful than truth. But when you go to the word of the God, you find out something. You find out that truth is more powerful, overcomes even natural facts. And that's the way it is with God. So we have our facts in life. It's a fact that it's this way. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's the way it is. But then truth goes to work and overcomes facts. For an example, let me give you an illustration of that. I, I uh, was thinking about it in the Old Testament. Here's David. The fact is, he's a young boy that's no experience in war whatsoever. And he's standing before Goliath a murdering machine of a human being that stands almost 10 feet tall, solid muscle and covered in every inch of his body so you can't penetrate to hurt him whatsoever with some form of armor. Fact is that Goliath is a young boy and fact is that guy's a murdering machine. The fact is that the armies of Israel are even afraid of him and the fact is it is probably no chance whatsoever, if any chance at all, of David beating Goliath. That's a fact. David all of a sudden starts to implement truth over fact. And he starts to say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defy the armies of the living God? And then he makes a statement and he says to this Philistine, Today, let it be known, I will take your head from your body and give your carcasses to the birds of the air, which all became truth as God wrote it in the scripture just that way. It was inspired word of God as he spoke it out. And truth that day overcame the facts that were before him. It's the same thing in your life. I look at the life of Jesus. He's got two fish and five loaves of bread. You've got to be kidding me. He's got anywhere from 10 to 14,000 people. That's like our entire, if you will, Sunday services one after another with five loaves of bread and two fish. My goodness sakes alive, he's going to do something. He's going to feed them and have leftovers. So everybody's full. Fact is, that's an impossibility. Fact is, it can't be done. Fact is, it's foolish to even think those terms. But the truth is, God said, hand it, bless it, hand it out, 
And truth overcame the facts. And you've got to see that in scripture because you'll be faced with facts every way you can think of it all through the rest of your life that try to overcome truth. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Jesus is in a boat in the back of the boat and a storm comes up and the disciples are petrified from the storm. Must have been a horrible storm. They start to sink and they go back to Jesus who's sleeping in the back of the boat and they said, Master, good master, don't you even care that we're about to perish? And Jesus looks at them and says, Oh, you of little faith, storm be still. Fact is, that's an impossibility. Fact is, I don't know of anybody that speaks in a storm, stops, and the seas get still. That's a fact. And guys, can I tell you something? All of a sudden, truth now overcame those facts. And in our thinking, in our verbs, in our mouth, in our mouth, in our speaking, we've got to have wisdom enough to realize that what we have sitting in our lap and inside of our heart is truth. And the Bible makes it very clear that truth is God's word. Not what I think or what could happen, but what God says. That's truth. God makes it very clear that where truth is at. It's important for all of us to understand that principle because without it, every day of your walk with God, you'll be bombarded with facts. You'll look at your checkbook and say, there's no way I can make it, yet somehow you made it. The fact was you weren't going to make it, but you're here tonight making it. And in fact, listen, listen, you didn't know where the food was coming from, but most of us are overweight. <laughs> Sorry if that offended you. I didn't mean it to. But you know what I'm talking about. Somehow we are confronted constantly with what we determine to be facts when we really have truth. Let me put up a little statement. It says God's truth overpowers worldly facts. If there's anything you need to understand about your, your future, if you're going to approach the future and be successful in any area of your life, if you're going to win over the giants of your life, if you're going to move from where you're at into the promised land that God has personally for you, and he has a promised land for you, you're going to have to get past the facts of this world that say you can't and get into a place of applying truth to the facts to change the outcome of your life. Just as simple as that. When our kids were going south, Deborah was in the word of God, speaking the word of God at night over our kids today that are all serving the Lord. Amen. At the time, it seemed like the stupidest thing in the world. Now let me, let me, let me, let me, let me let you in on something. I almost hesitate in saying this, but I've been around too long to know. I know... If I tell you this, I'm going to be under horrible attack for the next week or two. It's just the way it is. But I don't care. You're more important than the battle I'm going to fight. About a year and a half ago, my body was deteriorating so bad that I didn't know how I was going to get up and down on my knees in a church service. When I'd pray it, before a church service started, it was like a step of faith to go down and come back up because there was so much pain in my knees. I would question in my heart the facts. Every year it gets more difficult. Every year it's harder. Then the facts were supported by, that's natural. You're getting older. It's the natural way of life. And I just kind of bought into that. And when I would get up, I would say, maybe I could do this for another year on my knees, but soon I'll be standing next to the pulpit praying, standing. I found myself with arthritis in my hands. My knuckles, you probably can't see them from where you're at, were really swollen. They're still a little swollen, but not as much as they used to be. I couldn't close my hands for the last eight or nine years. I couldn't make a fist. 
at all, just about that far. If I got in a fist fight, I used to say I'd have to slap you. Remember that? <laughs> Not anymore. Yeah. Now listen. Listen. Now the pastor can make a fist. I can see the headlines now. <laughs> pastor Jim, at age almost 70, beats up parishioner who leaves church early. You know what I'm talking about? And other church members jump in to help him. Because you're right there with me about these people. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> My knees hurt. My bones hurt at night. I had horrible Charlie horses all night long. My, my, my muscles in my legs used to be enormous from when I was a professional baseball player. The muscles were shrinking down, everything. I, I was wondering how many years I had left in doing this. Then Pastor Dan, about a year and a half ago, started ministering in this subject about speaking the word, over, word of God over my life, which is truth over the facts. Are you following me? And I thought, what in the heck am I doing? I, I've taught that message a hundred times since I was 20 years old. I know this message. I know what verse he's going to next. And yet I wasn't doing it. I could not figure out why I wasn't doing it. And so I started just speaking the word of God. I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Four, five, eight, ten times a day, I would speak to different parts of my body, my heart, my lungs, my stomach, my arteries, my veins, my blood pressure, speaking it, speaking it, speaking it. And of course, facts hold on real tight. And then about a three quarters of a year ago, I started to literally feel better. The pain started to go. I would speak every single morning, every single night, and during the day a couple of times. My joints are fat and flourishing. My bones are renewed like the eagle. See, I'm speaking. Now, here's how it works. I'm speaking truth that's overcoming the facts. Arthritis, you've got to go. And the residue of arthritis and the swelling, you've got to come back to normal, which they almost all are. And, and, and it was changing my, my health structure. And I, 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 I had such a horrible arthritis in my back that I would go to the doctor and they would x-ray me and say, it's just arthritis. You've got arthritis in your back. You can't do anything now. And when I was 60, I gave up snow skiing because all of my, my joints were, once I fell, I, I couldn't get back up. My joints were so bad. And, and I started to lose out on life. I started, what happens is when you get older, it's the natural areas of life. And if I let the natural areas of life keep on going and I never put the truth on the natural, I will never change the natural by the truth. And I started speaking over my body and pain is literally gone from my body, from my back, from my knees, from my feet, my hands, my arms. Now, when it comes back, when it comes back every now and then, it wants to come back in, it'll come back in like, ooh. And I go, man, hey, wait a minute. I am healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior. Now, I, I, was, I, I, I hadn't played golf in a long time because playing golf, man, I'm telling you the next day, forget it. I might as well just go to the hospital. I was in such pain. Now I play golf, and the next day, I have no pain, no stiffness. Wait a minute. I haven't had that in 15 years where I could play golf and, and swing a golf club. I'm not a very good golfer, but I still like to play golf and swing a golf club. Listen to this. And not have any pain the next day, any stiffness? You say, are you exercising? Not a bit. <laughs> I'm only putting the word of God on the natural, that the facts that I've got arthritis, the facts that I've got, what can change that except the word of God? Are, are you following me? And so with that in mind, I want to share with you some scripture that 
I think you'll find fascinating. In Psalm 78, let's just pop it up on the overhead, verse number 35. It says this. Then they remembered the Lord, they remembered that God was their rock. And the most high God, their redeemer. So stop right there. Here's a group of people, and they know who God is. They remember that. Verse, go to verse number 36. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth, and they lied to him with their tongue. Well, wait a minute. Don't you find that a weird verse? They flattered with their mouth and lied with their tongue. Can I ask you a question? How do you flatter with your mouth but lie with your tongue? Isn't your tongue in your mouth? Isn't that a weird thing? And God spoke to me and said, they, they flatter with their mouth, but they lie by what they do with their tongue. In other words, they're put up with that. They know I'm their healer. They know that I'm their God. They know that I'm the mighty one. They tell me how wonderful I am, but they don't do what I tell them to do. And they find themselves, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, or the life lives is really the translation. Out of the abundance of the heart, you will live your life a certain way. So you can say something out of your mouth. Oh, we praise you, God. We praise you, God. Then go live some other way. Oh, God is my healer. God is my healer. God is my redeemer. God is my restorer. God is my king. He's my glory. He's my all in all. He's my everything. But then I live as if he's not there, and I live as if he's not important. And that's exactly what he's saying right there in those verses. Go with me, if you will, and you got your Bible. Go with Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter. In verse number 31, just pop it up on the overhead. So they came to you as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear my words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth, they show much love, but with their heart pursue their own gain. So I can come in the house of God and I can go, oh God, I praise you. Oh God, I love you. Oh God. But then there's a part of me that says, hey, wait a minute. If I'm all that to you, am I not your healer? Am I not your redeemer? Am I not the one who takes care of you? Am I not your provider? Am I not your protector? When I don't treat him like he's my provider and my redeemer and my protector, then all I'm doing is with my mouth, I'm flattering him, but with my lips... I'm a liar. Yeah. Verse number 32, go there. It says, indeed, you are to them as a well, lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. In other words, I can hear this and still not do it. You know what, why, what happened in my life? Can I just tell you something? I couldn't figure out why it was that I stopped making those truth statements about myself. All my life, I used to say, I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior. God provides all my needs according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And all of a sudden, I'm preaching the gospel, but I stopped doing it. You know why I stopped doing it? When I was young, I didn't have to have healing. I had nothing to measure my healing by. I felt good all the time. I didn't have back problems and joint problems and hand problems. I didn't have uh, neck problems and knee problems and feet problems and all those other kind of problems. Didn't have them. So when I made those confessions, I made those expressions about truth about my body, it meant nothing to me because I had no barometer. I had nothing to check it out by. I had no measuring system. Until I got older, now I can see the difference. Man, what the Word of God actually does make a difference. So why wait until you're old and broken, start speaking truth over the natural circumstances now? Every day. Take your gospel. You take pills every day. By the way, some of you might think, oh, yes, well, he's, he's pain free because he's full of Advil. I have nothing in me. No aspirin, no Advil, no uh, Tylenol, no, uh, what's that little yellow pill that, you, you, you know that one, what's that one that's for arthritis, you know, uh, yellow and white? Say it out loud, doctor. Huh? 
Nah, it wasn't that one. <laughs> but I don't take that either. <laughs> don't do it. Don't take any of that stuff. Don't, don't have a thing in me at all except the food Debbie cooked for me tonight. That's it. Nothing. And I feel like I'm, I, I can take on, and I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not working on areas like energy level and, and we're working on areas of my life. I'm not like 22 years old, but I'm not broken down. Because what happened is I'm now, now you can do this with your finances, you can do it with your children, you can do it with your marriage, you can do it, you take truth and keep speaking it over the facts. Is it a fact that your back hurts? Yes. Is it a fact that you're broke? Yes. Is it a fact you don't have any money? Yes. But you keep speaking the truth over it and then it changes. Why? Well, oh, listen to these words. Proverbs 4th chapter, pop it up on the overhead. Verse 20 says this, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my saying, what for? Verse number 21, do not let them depart and keep your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart. In other words, man, keep them right before you, the word of God all the time. Why? Verse number 22, for there are life to those who find them. And watch this, and health to all of their flesh, not to some of their flesh, Wait a minute, not just to when you're 22 and you can get healed from anything, but when you're 68, man, and fighting a battle like everybody else, and the natural is really coming on strong, can I tell you something? Now the health to all of his flesh, that really means something. So I am now taking the supernatural, using it against the, the natural to change my natural circumstances to a supernatural understanding. Are you following me? Let's go to James 3rd chapter, verse number 1. Watch this. Let's just look at it together. Let's have some fun together. Verse number 1. My brother, do not let many become teachers knowing that they shall receive a stricter judgment. Okay? So that has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I just threw it in there for fun. Verse number 2. <laughs> for we all stumble in all things. If anyone does not stumble in word, you know, when I let something happen in my body without applying truth to it, let me say that again to you. When I let something happen in my body without applying truth to it, when I let something happen in my finances without applying truth to it, if I let something happen in my business without applying truth to it, if I let something happen in my marriage without applying truth to it, then I have absolutely stumbled in word. And he says this, if anyone does not stumble, he's a perfect or mature man, able to bridle his whole body. Wait a minute. Bridle means to keep under control. Instead of the body going doing what it wants to do, you know, letting arthritis come in and letting pains and aches and joints come in, letting sickness come in, letting the body control our eating habits, which it's done very well with me lately. Listen, letting the body control my eating habits. Letting body, listen, my Bible says that man, if he'll, he'll bridle his whole body, he'll bring under control his whole body. Instead of, listen, if you have the right words that you are speaking and you're speaking the truth of what God says about yourself, can I just say something? You're going to be able to control your whole body, not some of your body, your whole body, every part of your body. That's mentally, socially, physically, uh, uh, every area of your body. You're going to be able to control it. But if you just let it control you, you're a wild person and you're subject to whatever natural life gives you. Is anybody listening? So he's able to bridle his whole body. Verse number three comes along and it says, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouth. Now he gives us an example that may obey us. And we turn their whole body. He's making an, he's saying there's something little in a horse's mouth that turns the whole entire body. Can you imagine something little in your mouth that can turn the entire existence around? Can you imagine some little thing inside of you that can change the condition of your whole body? That's what he's saying right in these verses. A little thing, verse number four. It says, look also at ships, although 
They are large and are driven by fierce winds. They are turned by a small little rudder, whatever way the pilot desires. Verse number five. He says, even so the tongue is a little member that boasts great things. In other words, here's this little tongue. It can either agree with the natural, it can agree with the facts. Well, man, I just feel like crap today. Wow, I look ugly. Wow, I'm really getting fatter all the time. Nobody will ever want me. I will never be important. I will never have anything. Oh, only thing I can ever hope for is I'll just get through this earth and I'll just die and go to heaven and that's all I could ever be. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I can't do this. But my Bible just said that we can control our whole body by what's in your mouth, that little tongue. In other words, if you're going to speak the truth over the facts and believe it, it's going to change the whole body. And just now he says this, even so the tongue is a little member that boasts great things. See how great the forest, uh, a little fire kindleth. In other words, a little spark can set a whole forest fire on fire. Again, a little spark, boom, can ignite an entire forest fire. So in other words, can I just say this? If I'm speaking truth, it may seem like nothing and little, but it can change the whole world that I live in. Because somehow truth outpowers, overpowers, overshadows the facts of human living. Is anybody listening? That's why Jesus could stand and say, be still. That's why he could look at the woman and say, be healed. Because guess what? It wasn't those facts they were. In fact, was she sick? Yes. Well, raised from the dead. Were, 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 were they dead? Yes. No diffs. Come forth, Lazarus. How could he do that? He's facts are dead. And what he did is he spoke forth. And he's given us an example that we need to be people who are creative and smart enough to speak forth. Why would we do that? Because truth overcomes the facts that are of the world. So he comes along and he makes a statement that's a bizarre statement. And he says this, a little word can catch on your whole body and destroy your whole life. He's using it on the negative, but if you use it on the negative, you can also use it on the positive. A little word can also build your whole body. Remember, control the whole body, verse number six. In James 3rd chapter, verse number six, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Now, this is on the negative. Anything that's on the negative has to reflect back to the positive, too. So if I say black, there's also white. If I say wrong, that means this, there's a right. Are you following me? So he says, a tongue is a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. Wait a minute. The tongue defiles the whole body. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? The tongue defiles the whole body. Wait a minute. I heard a couple of verses before that that said anybody who controls the tongue will control his whole body. But here the tongue, if it's not controlled, defiles the whole body. So the call to whether or not your future is failing because of natural circumstances around you or your future is blessed by God is all wrapped up in your mouth. I didn't say this. God said this. This is That's why I said earlier, you either believe the word of God or don't believe. By the way, in case you want to know this, James the half-brother of Jesus. He's not an idiot. And happened to be the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. He, the tongue is set among us as members, and it defiles the whole body and sets on, uh, on fire the course of nature. If the tongue sets on fire the course of nature, then what stops nature and it's fire is what your tongue speaks that brings your whole body back in control. In other words, your words can control natural circumstances. I live in natural circumstances. I'm an old man who's going downhill physically. And as I do, not one of you, not one of you would think anything of it. The problem with it is God says something about it. I may still go down until I go home to be with the Lord, but I don't have to go down so fast that I become useless in my last days. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set by fire 
of hell. In other words, this is on the negative side. So if my tongue can set on fire the course of natural things, then guess what? As I control my tongue, it brings forth natural under obedience. Is anybody listening? Verse number seven. It says, and every kind of beast and, and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Verse number eight. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So now you have to stop and think, okay, I just read this, so I guess maybe God is saying to us, he's in heaven. See, I, I told them they need to control the tongue, but they can't. So these are little fools on the earth that I've just tricked. Because I just told them that they, if they control their tongue, they control their whole life. Now that comes along and he says, but nobody can control the tongue. What's he talking about? Is he just tricking us? No, your tongue can't be controlled by you. It's got to be controlled by the God on the inside of you. The words that you speak are not energized because you speak the words. It's the God behind your words that makes it come to pass because you believe in him for what you're speaking. Is anybody listening? This is not some miracle thing that you just speak out and all of a sudden, you know, abracadabra. This is not some foolish little thing that you do. You're speaking forth what God wants to bring to pass. Therefore, God gets behind it and brings it to pass. I can't control my tongue by myself, according to what he said, but I can control my tongue by the power of the Holy Spirit. Is anybody getting that? Verse number nine. With it, I bless our Father in heaven. Don't you see us? With it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. In other words, what we're doing is we speak some things that are blessing God, other things that are cursing people. That's what we do about ourselves. Oh, we love you, God. We bless you, God. We give you great lip service, but we lie about you because we really don't believe your word is truth that can overcome facts. Verse number 10. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brother, and these things ought not to be. Verse number 11. Does a spring set forth fresh water and, and bitter from the same opening? In other words, you and I have got to control what comes out of our mouth. And we can do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse number 12. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Verse 13. Watch this. Who is wise and, and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness and in wisdom. Verse number 14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. In other words, guys, what you have in your heart has got to be according to what God has to say. He just uses that against somebody else. The illustration there is how we, we pick on people. We say one thing and defeat one thing, but the subject is really the words of your mouth. Yeah. And so all of us can't lie any longer against the truth. If we're going to change the course of nature and control our whole body, we're going to have to speak something that's beyond the natural, beyond the facts. Facts are very important, but there's something more powerful than facts, and it's the Word of God. And when you put faith behind what God says, it changes the facts. Facts don't change you. That's the good thing about it. Last verse for tonight is found in, if you will, in Proverbs. Just pop it up for me. In the 16th chapter, verse 24. Watch this. Pleasant words. Stop right there. What is pleasant words? Oh, you're so nice. Oh, you're so sweet. Aren't you kind, loving? Uh, pleasant words are words that are full of life. Watch this. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. What's a honeycomb? It's a little box full of sweetness, health, goodness that's natural. And it explodes with good flavor. Sweetness to the soul, watch this, and health to the what? Why is he talking about bones when he's talking about sweet words? Health to the bones? Nothing's going to change a hard old bone. Oh, yeah? 
The Word of God can change it. Why? Because here's why. Because truth overcomes facts. And Jesus' whole life walked around where truth spoken overcame facts of reality. So you can believe in the facts or start speaking the truth and watch God change it in your life. Now here's the, here's the call that you have. Here's the choice. You can live the rest of your life saying you're a big loser. Live the rest of your life saying you're a big fat slob and nobody would ever want anything to do with you. You can say the rest of your life, I hate myself. I can't stand the way I look. I think I'm disgusting. I'm stupid. God can never use me. I'm nothing. And all you're doing is playing into the hand of the natural. Because that's the natural way. Or you can get off the natural and get on the supernatural. Get off the facts and get on the truth. I'm born of the Spirit of God. I'm blood washed. I'm a child of God. I'm a king's kid. I have blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed coming. I'm blessed going. In fact, it gives God great pleasure to prosper the hands of his servants and I am a servant and I will be prosperous. God gives me strength to get wealth. God blesses me. You can speak. Arthritis, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Get out of my body. And I tell you now, and loose you to get out of my body because I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? For a good three quarters of a year every day, five times a year, I did not feel any different. And then all of a sudden, like something broke. Man, I woke up one morning and the pain was gone. It wanted to come back as soon as I acknowledged it was gone. And I spoke, I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm healed and all, everything I put my hand to, I shall prosper. God opens doors no man can open. God closes doors no man can close. I'm not a big, fat, ugly slob. I'm a child of God and I'm a beauty. And guess what? Body, I command you now in the name of Jesus to get in line with the word of God. God loves me. God sees me as important. He went to the cross for me and died for me. I am not a loser. I'm a winner. I'm more than a conqueror. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm healed. Lungs, I'm speaking to you now. Be clear. Arteries, be clear. I'm speaking to you now. Joints, you're fat and flourishing. I'm speaking to you now. Bones, you're renewed like the eagle. You're not going to lose hair. I'm telling you to grow now in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you now, eyesight, you're going to be better than you've ever been. Stomach, I'm telling you now. Esophagus, I'm telling you now. You're healed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you now. Intestines, I am healed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. By his stripes, I am healed. I'm telling you now. Prostrate. Go down in size. I'm telling you now, kidneys and bladder and veins and blood pressure. I have the mind of Christ. I have no spirit of fear on me. I have the love of God on the inside of me. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. And every day you battle until you win. Why? Because truth overcomes the natural. And you are going to have to ask someone older than me what sex is like at 70 because I'm having a good time with my Debbie. And that goes with it. Amen. Yeah. 
Here's the reason why. Put up that one little statement, John, that talks about God's truth overpowers worldly facts. And Jesus is the example, example, example in the New Testament, and everything in the Old Testament says exactly the same thing. Example after example. You can believe it or not believe it. See, it's your call. I want you to know something. Look, I'm telling you, I haven't done that in six years. I, I got a pastor call me. For, he's in town from Australia. And he says, you want to play golf? Not usually now, in the last three years, the answer to that was, I'm really busy. I don't think I want to. I'm going to play golf and I'm going to beat him on Friday. <laughs> Just the way it is. Why? Because truth overcomes facts. Oh, yeah, there's a fact. You're broke. There's a fact you don't have a job. You're a fact you don't have uh, favor. You're a fa it's a fact you have brains. It's a fact that your body hurts. It's a fact. You can either listen to the facts or start speaking the truth. It works. What can I tell you? It just works. This pot belly, it's going in the name of Jesus. As I'm speaking, I have control over you. You do not have control over me. And then mama puts out ice cream and it's all over. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> well, did anybody get anything out of that tonight? It's true. I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. To me, the greatest part of every message is not just the singing, which is wonderful, and the word of God, which is always fun, but also at the end where God just throws out a net and brings people home. Today, here you are in the house of God. One of the great tragedies in American churches is sometimes us preachers are pretty stupid. We think everybody who comes to our church is okay with God. Nothing could be worse. Nothing could be a bigger fallacy than that. Nothing could be worse than let people go just because they come to your church and you assume they're all right with God. I want to make sure you're all right with God before you leave. I love you enough care for you enough to tell you the truth. Put it all aside and tell you just the way it is. Let's get in each other's face, but let's talk truth. Here's what I want to ask you. If you walk out of this place tonight, and your heart stopped and you died, what a horrible thing. But would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Let's talk about it. Your answer to that question says a lot about where you're at with God. So don't just look at me right now Answer the question, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Tonight is your night of salvation. Some of you might have said, well, Pastor Jim, I think I'm going to go to heaven. I think I'm going to make it. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to think your way into heaven. You're not going to make it. Because nowhere it says positive thinkers get to go to heaven. Some of you might say, well, I hope, I hope I'm going to make it. Guess what? Nowhere does it say because you hope enough you get to make it to heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say to yourself, well, I love God a whole lot, Pastor Jim. I'm going to go to heaven. I think I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. After all, I'm here tonight showing that I love God. I'm glad you're here too, and it does show that you love God. The problem with that is that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can go to heaven because you love God. You're not going to make it if you think because you love God you're going to make it to heaven. It's not that way. That's not how you get to heaven. Jesus comes along and tells us these words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way except his way. Not my way, not your way, not well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get there his way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get there his way. I'll tell you what that is in a moment. Some of you might say to yourself, well, I always thought of myself as a Christian. I mean, I just celebrated Easter. Uh, I, I remember Christmas, baby in the manger, sang the songs. All my life, I've always thought of myself as a Christian. But can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible is to say because you thought of yourself as a Christian. Celebrated Christmas and Easter, you get to go to heaven. See, I already know 
you know who Jesus is or you wouldn't be here. Of course you know who Jesus is. But having head knowledge about who Jesus is won't get you to heaven. This is really not about, look at me now, look at me. It's really not about what you have in your head. It's really about what you've done with your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? Jesus comes along in John 3rd chapter. He says you must be born again. When I use those words, born again, immediately people turn off in American churches. Hollywood has portrayed born again people as idiots and fools, radicals and fanaticals and just screwballs. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about the word born again and it means something. Most people don't even know what it means, but let me tell you what born again means. After all, if Jesus said you must be born again, don't you think you ought to know about what in the heck that means? Because if you must be something, you ought to know what it means to be something. So let me tell you what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing. That's what it means. That means you've given God all of your heart. That means you've given God all of your life. You got to give it to him. He's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to make you do it or a manipulator to make you do it. He's not floating around, as I say every time, on a cosmic cloud with a two by four to hit you in the head until you finally give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. But you've got to willingly give him all of your heart. You've got to willingly give him all of your life. Listen to me. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you by the scripture. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. You know what he just really said? That's a pretty blunt statement. He really just said, listen to this. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Wow. That's what he just really said. That's amazing. Lukewarm people are not going to make it. That's what he just said. And some of you have been lukewarm. You've been a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're, hey, you know what? The bottom line, you're not against God. You're not. But you're not wholehearted for God. And that's the difference. It's an all or nothing relationship. Until you give God all of your heart, until you give God all of your life, and be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? I mean, I've always thought of myself as a Christian. My parents had me christened and baptized when I was a baby. I joined my last church. I was there for 14 years. I really thought I was saved. But can I tell you something? It's not about mental ascension to whether or not you're saved. It's about knowing in your heart that you are because you've given God all of your heart and given God all of your life. So tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three because Jesus said it like this. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And then you can put it right back down. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. No, no. I've already got him there. Now I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. And I'll see your hand go up and you can put it right back down. Hands are already going up, but let's do it all at the same time. I'll count to three. Is that okay? And we'll all do it at the same time. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart. Get ready to put your hand up. Tonight is your night of salvation. If you've never given him all of your life, tonight is your night of salvation. Get ready to raise your hand. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure tonight is your night. Are you ready? I'm going to count to three. I'm going to pop my hands together. You can get your hand up all over this place. Put it right back down. Simple as that. Let's all do it at the same time. Back in the family rooms, wherever you're at. 
in the foyer by television. If you're online right now, right in your living room or wherever you're watching, you can get your hand up and get right with God. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three. Here it is. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. Hold on, hold on. You want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. Yep, you will be. But it's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people see instead of what God sees. Come on, tonight, don't let anything stop you from getting right with God. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. Back over here. I saw another hand back here. Twelve. Anybody else? Back over on this side. Thank you. There's 13. God bless you. There's 14. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody back over here? There's 15, 16, 17. Thank you. 18, back over there, thank you. Where are you, 19? You know you need to get your hand up. Anybody else? There's 18 or 19 people. Ready? Get your hand up. Anybody else, real quick? Anybody, 18 or 19 people? Need to give up your life and give it to Jesus. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, thank God for 18 people. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Tonight is your night of salvation. All 18 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get out of your seat. If you raise your hand and you're serious about this with God, if you're serious, I want you to get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Bring a friend if you need to. If you're sitting next to somebody and they raise your hand but they're not coming, man, nudge them and say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. I want you to get out of your seat. No one leaves during this period of time. We'll all stand and welcome them as they come. Come right up here and meet me right here in front. No weird stuff comes on. You just come right now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I believe. Get right with God. Come on home. Come on, there's time for you. Come on, get up here. Come on. Thank God, thank God, thank God you've come. Well, all of you, thank God you've come. We just love you so much. I want you to look to your left. This is Pastor Joel. He's waving at you. The reason he's waving at you is going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. you got to do that. Number two, he's going to give you some free information about now that you're a Christian, you know, what to do next. What's this all about? So that is very important. Take it home, read about it, simple reading, three things. And number three, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. It's personal trainers like friends. We give away friends that will help you, pray for you, meet you before church service, encourage you so you don't fall through the cracks, but you keep coming back to church and going on with God. Let us help you get strong. That's our commitment to you. And if you'll give God one year at this church, I'm telling you, you will never be the same. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Uh, if you did one year, the rest of your life is going to be blessed. So make a left turn. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Thank God, God.